evening and welcome to June's Astro Talk. This month we come to you live from the comfort of our homes. Uh, why, you might ask? Well, the Royal Botanic Gardens of Victoria are currently uh, running their Lightscape event. And whilst Light's not an astronomer's friend, I can say from uh, being there last night that the lighting event that they're currently hosting does look very, very enticing and is worth looking into. So if you're looking for something to do over the next few months, I'd recommend going along and having a look. Tonight, we'll be graced by the presence of the Astronomical Society of South Australia's President, Hans Notke. But before we begin, I would like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Um, the ACV loves to bring you these streams and we couldn't do it without your support. So remember, if you're enjoying tonight's stream on Facebook, you can donate stars. Those on YouTube can donate stickers. Uh, if you're watching us for the first time, don't forget to subscribe, subscribe and follow our Facebook and YouTube pages. With the formalities out of the way, let me introduce you to Hans Notke, ASSA's president. Hans has worked for the German Foreign Office and served mostly in the Middle East and Africa as ambassador or in other capacities. From 2008 to 2011, he was appointed German Consul General in Sydney, and in that capacity, he was fortunate enough to win the support of prominent Australian astronomer Fred Watson and David Malin um, for his efforts to enhance German-Australian scientific cooperation in areas like astronomy, physics and astrophysics, as well as radio astronomy. Uh, in 2014, after retiring from active duty, Hans settled within his wife's hometown of Adelaide, where he continues to pursue his lifelong passion for astronomy, uh, joining ASA and ASA elected him their president this year. Tonight, Hans will be speaking about what's in a name, Astronomy Made in Germany, where he will discuss the important contributions of Kepler, Fraunhofer and Schmidt. Hans, welcome to the stream. I'll get you in. Um, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for uh, the, those welcoming words. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to continue a tradition between our two societies, to exchange speakers every year. And uh, what I want to talk to you about is uh, more in an anecdotal way about uh, three chapters of astronomy made in Germany. I speak of astronomy made in Germany, not so much of German astronomers, because especially the last fellow in my list, Bernhard Schmidt. Uh, he's usually referred to as either German or Estonian, but in reality, his uh, personal history is much more complicated. He was born the son of an ethnic German father uh, belonging to the German-speaking minority in Estonia and a Swedish-speaking um, Estonian. Uh, and he received Russian uh, nationality at birth because when he was born in 1879, Estonia was still a province of the Russian Empire. Uh, then between the two world wars, Estonia had a brief period of independence. And uh, from uh, 1906 on, Bernhard Schmidt mostly lived in uh, Germany and uh, he, uh, his entire career was more or less in uh, Hamburg, and he died German national. But it didn't save him from uh, two years of internment because he immigrated to Germany as a Russian citizen, was a hostile alien during World War I. Eventually, his astronomical protectors and mentors uh, got him out of that. But uh, let's uh, start with um, uh, Kepler the uh, first name on my list. Before I do that, I just want to give credit to some of the materials I've used. I've uh, uh, chosen a, a couple of images and other materials from a couple of archives. I've listed them here. And um, what do all these three names have in common? Well, for one, they're all associated with uh, instrument making. To start with Bernard Schmidt, uh, the Schmidt telescope or the Schmidt camera, and this is the very first one that he himself helped build, uh, is associated with his name. And uh, his uh, idea to have an optical system consisting of both a lens and a mirror was really what uh, caught on also in amateur astronomy. Uh, the owners of Schmidt-Cassegrens will know that, and there are other varieties of that 
kind of system, the Schmidt Newtonian, uh, the Richie Chrétien, the, the Fastar and Hyperstar models, and the Rowe Ackermann, they all go back to that original idea. And next, right next to it, you see the famous Dorpat refactor. That is something that was built by Joseph Fraunhofer, and I'll tell you more about this and how he came to be the excellent instrument builder that he was. That instrument here is not the original Dorpat, that's still in Dorpat, a small town near uh, the center of uh, Estonia. This is the one that was delivered to the University Observatory of Berlin, and it is the one through which uh, Louis d'Arrest uh, had discovered the planet Neptune following computations of French astronomer Le Verrier. At the very bottom, you see the typical pirate telescope, the one that can be extended. Um, and that is a design that goes back to Kepler. Kepler was not uh, an optical technician. He never built an instrument. But uh, when he finally got hold of a Galilean telescope, it was the one that was designed for the Holy Roman Emperor who handed it to Kepler, who was his uh, mathematician and astronomer he immediately discovered one flaw, and that was that you look through the Galilean telescope like through a straw. You would never get a satisfactory field of view. And then he said, why not exchange the convex lens for a, a concave one? And immediately you had an image that was uh, in a much broader field of view, but it was now upside down. And um, Kepler realized if you want to get it uh, right again, you needed to add another concave element. And that in turn required a much longer optical tube, hence these pirate telescopes. He never built one, he probably never looked through one, but these are the contributions of these three names to instrument making. What triggered my interest in Kepler were two important new biographies that appeared not so long ago on the German market. They are both marked for translations into English, but I don't think that has happened yet. Uh, one the, was as big as a, a Bible, Kepler's Welt, nor Kepler's World. That was written by a theologian and explained in uh, uh, ways that I haven't uh, seen before, the really difficult situation of someone in the uh, uh, late Renaissance uh, fighting both uh, imperial and papal authorities in order to get uh, the Copernican message out. That was really fascinating for me uh, to read and uh, Kepler was right in the middle of it. And the other one was written by Thomas de Padova. He is a young German Italian, Italian father, German mother. He's at home in both countries and he concentrated on the complicated relationship between Kepler and uh, uh, Galileo Galilei, who lived at the same time in Italy, and he provided important insights. Really a good read, and when it is translated into English, I recommend that. Uh, Kepler, uh, as I already mentioned, had two important influences in his life. One was Copernicus, and Kepler, I think he understood himself as the one whose mission in life was to help Copernicus' ideas uh, to break through in Europe. Copernicus' heliocentric cosmology was well known. It appeared a generation before Kepler was born in printed uh, form, but it was not much discussed and it was not yet detected by the authorities of the Holy Inquisition uh, to be put on the index of forbidden books. And ironically, it was Kepler's doing that eventually uh, Copernicus's books would be prohibited by the Holy Inquisition together with the books of Kepler and also the books of Galileo's Galilei on the uh, right-hand side, uh, who, uh, like Kepler, was an ardent uh, defender of Copernicus. The basic difference between Kepler and uh, Galileo, in my opinion, is that Galileo, in every sense, was a man of modern science, applying modern scientific methods and only those, whereas Kepler tried to think and to move within the constraints that the uh, religious dogma set uh, has set uh, for uh, people venturing into cosmology, which uh, 
was uh, not without risks. And here is another man that had an enormous influence on Kepler and made his big success uh, in the history of sciences possible. And that is Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe is famous for two things. One is the incredible precision of his measurements with the instruments that he designed and had built for him with a lot of support for the Danish king. The other thing is he lost his nose in a sword fight when he was a young man. Um, probably more famous and more worth remembering are his measurements. He uh, did this for a while in his own uh, observatory in Denmark, then he had to leave Denmark when the king was succeeded by his youngest son, a gullible young man, uh, influenced mostly by people who were jealous of uh, Tycho. Tycho was uh, then wandering through northern Germany, but eventually uh, settled in Prague, which was the second capital of the Holy Roman Empire, who appointed him to be his royal astronomer or imperial astronomer, and also uh, the uh, imperial astrologer. How did Kepler get interested in um, uh, astronomy? Well, he often uh, wrote about a childhood experience, and that was when his mother took him uh, in, the, in front of the city gates, and there he witnessed the great comet of 1577. We know today, uh, based on uh, Tycho's uh, measurements, that this is a comet that none of us will ever get to see. It is one that will disappear in the Oort clouds for more than a thousand years. And we don't have enough computations to know when he will be back. But it was a big thing. It was uh, reported uh, all over Europe as uh, the biggest comet ever seen. And there was just 600 kilometers south of uh, Kepler, there was another young boy, an Italian boy, who watched the same comet and wrote about it, and it impressed him just as much as it did Kepler. And his name was Galileo Galilei. And uh, there you see him, and now you don't, or the other way around. And uh, this is uh, Kepler's birthplace. I was there not so long ago. It's still uh, uh, a beautiful uh, little town, a small town. And Kepler here was uh, for the first time already confronted with the religious uh, conflicts of his time because his father, a Lutheran, was the Lord Mayor, but the city was mostly Catholic. And uh, Kepler learned from a very early uh, age on that this could be really a dangerous uh, situation. Uh, he was a wonder child in every respect. It, people noticed that he was brighter than everybody else, but he didn't have it easy in his childhood. He described his father as being immoral and quarrelsome. He was a mercenary and runaway husband. Actually, he was an artillery officer and he uh, ran away from his wife, who was uh, quarrelsome as well, and uh, tried to make some money on the battlefields in the Netherlands where the rebellion against the Spanish just started. Uh, Kepler was equally critical of his mother, called her garrulous and cantankerous, and eventually she would be accused of practicing witchcraft, and it was John Kepler who got her out of that not, uh, of that very dangerous situation. Uh, John Kepler was also a rather sickly, uh, but nevertheless a bright and brilliant boy, and uh, uh, his grandparents don't fare better in his critical views also called them uh, uh, difficult people, but at least the grandparents were the ones who made sure that he would get an excellent school education. And from there, he went to the city of Tübingen, even today one of the most beautiful university cities uh, today. And there he was taught by this man, Mr. Mestlin, astronomer, and also a very early admirer of uh, Copernicus. And it was probably him who told Kepler his mission in life had to be to uh, help uh, Copernicus' ideas to break through that they deserve. It was an uh, interesting time that Kepler was born into. It was the late Renaissance, uh, especially in Italy. Uh, this was uh, the time where you had names like Michelangelo and Leonardo uh, really making clear to everyone that this was the apex of uh, European civilization uh, and uh, was nevertheless uh, 
dangerous time as well because never before and never since were more witches burned at the stake than during this time. And also torture became uh, quite a normal practice. It was part of the methods of jurisprudence. And it was also a very uh, effective way of uh, telling unruly um, or convincing unruly uh, cosmologists uh, to recant their erroneous uh, beliefs. Likewise, Europe had uh, witnessed uh, the most horrific uh, religious wars. It was still more to come and Kepler would get the full brunt of it when the 30 years war started uh, in Germany. And uh, as always, target number one in these conflicts, uh, heretics had a particular uh, dangerous life. Uh, here you have it on the left, you see the uh, princes encouraging science and the scientists. But if you uh, hang your head out too much out of the window, uh, this is what could happen to you. This is an image of Giordano Bruno who suggested there could be multiple solar systems that could also be inhabited by uh, intelligent beings and that ended him right there in the middle of flames. So not a good idea to go too much against uh, the uh, Christian faith because whenever cities changed sides, the first people they went after were heretics like this poor fellow whose uh, survival chance was getting close to zero. Uh, there were two ways that uh, scientists tried to protect themselves. One was the one that, uh, that Copernicus has chosen, himself a man of the church and a religious man for that. He devoted his uh, works to Pope Paul III, and that saved these books from being banned for uh, a couple of uh, uh, decades. At the time of uh, uh, Kepler's uh, arrival on the scene, they were still available. And uh, the other way, that was the one that Kepler chose, was to put himself under the protection of the mighty Holy Roman Emperor, who was the defender of the Catholic faith, but Pope and Emperor were both dependent of each other. So if you have one of the two behind you, you were pretty safe. Uh, let me quickly go through the uh, um, important stages of Kepler's life. Uh, once he was finished with his studies, he moved to the city of Graz. He got there a teaching position at the local uh, college, which was, which was not much more than a high school, uh, which was quite satisfactory for him because it allowed him time for his uh, studies outside the college. And uh, from there, he went uh, to uh, the uh, city of Graz in uh, southeastern Austria, uh, very Catholic, and there he got himself into quite a bit of a conflict uh, with both the Lutherans uh, and uh, the uh, Catholics, and it showed him to be a uh, pretty good uh, uh, and pretty mature uh, free thinker. But from there, he also received call from uh, Tycho, who asked him to work for him, and after some troubles initially, that's exactly what he did. He went to Prague, and there he would reach the apex of his uh, creativity. But eventually, he would have to leave Prague after he finished much of his uh, uh, work, and he moved again to uh, uh, Austria, to the city of Linz. And uh, in Linz, uh, he had a similar position that he already had in Graz, that is being uh, a teacher at uh, um, college or high school college and uh, finally uh, he went to Silesia working for uh, a military man before he uh, finally ended in the city of uh, Ratisbon where he died. I said that he put himself under the protection of the Holy Roman Emperor and that chance came when Tycho Brahe died uh, and Tycho Brahe made sure that Kepler would be appointed as his successor as the imperial mathematician and also the imperial uh, astronomer. As such, he had the obligation to finish the Rudolphine tables. That was a star catalog, but with uh, also the ambition of predicting exactly where the planets would be in the future. And uh, uh, this was something that uh, 
was actually to be paid by the emperor, but it was not also uh, good to be in the emperor's uh, uh, services. It was also expensive because the emperor expected Kepler, of course, to be paying for the publication out of his own purse and then make sure somehow that he would get paid back from one of the emperor's sources. And uh, he himself was never in a hurry to pay his debts uh, to Kepler. In between, he had to go to Stuttgart, where his mother had been accused of witchcraft. And being also a doctor of law, he managed to get her out of that calamity. Uh, let's go to the uh, scientific heritage of uh, Kepler. Kepler was obsessed with finding the world mystery, and he thought he found them in the so-called five platonic bodies of Euclidean geometry. And um, this was very intelligent, very fine to read, esoteric, we would call it today, but there is little science left uh, in uh, this uh, uh, enigma of the world. And uh, similar uh, with the harmonies of the world, where he tried to combine planetary orbits with music and Euclidean geometry, although he eventually placed his uh, Keplerian uh, laws of planetary motion in that, there's also a lot of things where we say uh, much intelligent wasted on these ideas. To give you uh, an aspect of uh, uh, a human touch of uh, Kepler's life, Kepler, uh, like so many at that age, married young. He married a 20-year-old woman who was already twice widowed when he married her. And uh, as was not unusual at that time, they had five children. Most of them died in uh, childhood. And eventually his first wife succumbed to uh, typhoid fever. And um, already half a year later, Kepler was trying to find a new bride. And we have an um, uh, amazing uh, detailed uh, account of what happened. Kepler asked really everyone he knew to help him identify the suitable bride. In all, he had 11 proposals, but he refused all of them. One had uh, body odor, the next one had too much muscle mass, and uh, uh, another again uh, didn't have money. What he wanted was a woman that was young enough to give him more children, that was strong enough uh, to do all the house chores, that were also hopefully of noble descent, or at least have a little bit of money of her own and not dependent entirely on him for his income. And I think he was also after what we might today call sex appeal. And none of the 11 satisfied him. Then someone said, look, try number three five again, which he did. Eventually, he married Susanna Kepler, and together they had, for that time, a relatively good marriage and uh, uh, would hope also a bit of happiness. At one point, the emperor told Kepler when he was getting on his nerves again, demanding payment for the Rudolphine tables, why don't you go into the employment of my supreme commander, Albrecht von Wallenstein, and uh, he believes in astrology, he'll pay you whatever you need, and hopefully he'll also pay for the Rudolphine tables. And that's what uh, Wallenstein um, did. He did pay handsomely, but he didn't pay for the emperor's debts. Wallenstein was uh, offspring of uh, a minor Bohemian or Czech uh, nobility, but he was an uh, ingenious uh, commercial talent as well. And that was important because in the oncoming religious wars, a uh, supreme commander was sup supposed to be able to organize, to pay, and to keep uh, marching uh, mercenary armies. And Wallenstein did just that. And from a small uh, country nobleman, he rose to become the most important uh, prince in all of the Holy Roman Empire. But that was also his demise. The emperor became envious and suspicious, and eventually a gang of Scottish and Irish mercenaries killed him, uh, and assaulting him while he was asleep. Uh, 
But uh, Weinstein was also a great believer in uh, astrology and Kepler had a reputation of being one of the best. And one of the questions I'm often asked, how is it that an intelligent man who looked through everything uh, became involved in astrology? Um, I think uh, the answer has to be that it came with a job. In all the other jobs he's had in, in Austria, in Graz and Linz, uh, he was expected uh, to uh, make horoscopes for his employers and also for the local uh, authorities. And uh, Kepler was extremely successful. He predicted uh, the future um, uh, very well. He said there would be more invasions by Turkish troops. That was a no-brainer. He said there would be bad harvests. Well, this was the time of the Little Ice Age, also a no-brainer. He said that the emperor once abdicated would soon die, again a non-brainer, but if you hit uh, uh, more than 50 times uh, the correct answer, then uh, you're considered uh, a genius in astrology, and that helped uh, Wallenstein. But he also mocked as astrologers, called many of them charlatans, so he knew there was something uh, fishy about astrology. Now, uh, this is a bit more complicated. I want to talk briefly about Kepler's uh, lasting um, uh, achievements, uh, the, the, how he came to do the uh, uh, laws of planetary motions. That was during the time in Prague. Uh, he eventually had to leave Prague because there was civil unrest, but he took with him all uh, the uh, papers, all the documents from Tycho Brahe, and he uh, was fascinated by the orbit of planet Mars. And after Tycho died, who never let him have full access, he finally did have full access. And he came to compute Mars's uh, revolution around uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Earth, as was in the Ptolemyan cosmology assumed. And he said, it must look like something that he has uh, drawn up there, and it was called the uh, Kepler pretzel, and uh, what he said, uh, Kepler, was very similar to what Einstein later said, this cannot be right, there is something flawed in the assumption of the uh, geocentric um, uh, cosmology, and uh, to uh, better understand what this was um, about, have a closer look at uh, this image. Uh, it shows how uh, um, a planet uh, attached to an inclined sphere uh, revolving uh, uh, Earth, what his revolution would look like. It would be a hippopede. Uh, that's this uh, line eight there at the bottom. Uh, that would be an explanation also for the retrograde movements of the planets as seen against the background of fixed stars. Uh, it's hard to understand this theory, but you need to assume a celestial global axis um, directed north-south. Uh, then uh, a body at its equator, uh, which would rise uh, exactly through the zenith, and it would descend ventricularly uh, to the west, uh, as you could see A in this case uh, of the image. If, however, the axis would be inclined upward, uh, that is towards south, like in uh, case B, then the body rising in the east deviates to the north, misses the zenith, and goes obliquely down in the west. But obviously, the spherical theory uh, was also deeply flawed. Uh, and the most ludicrous uh, proposition was that, uh, not just that there must be big crystal mm, translucent spheres, but uh, what was also extremely incredible was that the outermost sphere with the fixed stars attached to it, uh, which uh, already the Greeks knew, uh, would be incredibly far away. And that would have to be the fastest moving sphere, revolving in just 24 hours, once around its own axis and taking all the other inclined spheres with it. And that could simply not be. So... Um, a new theory was born, that was the theory of epicycles. What was imagined here was that uh, the uh, 
revolution of the planets around Earth was not really circular. In fact, planets was assumed uh, were circling around a so-called equant, and uh, that would explain their retrograde movement, but would make the whole system ever more uh, complicated. And um, eventually, um, Kepler had a look at uh, Copernicus's uh, system. Copernicus assumed, like Ptolemy and Aristotle, that all spheres, all circles uh, in heaven must be perfectly circular. Why? Because otherwise it was assumed uh, there would never keep a momentum going that would last through all eternity. That was the conception they had. And also there was a religious element, they thought, when God creates something like this, it must be perfect. And then Kepler said to himself, um, if I do away with a couple of assumptions of Copernicus, where would that leave me? And then suddenly he had intuitively the right idea. He said, no, the Earth's orbit around the sun is not circular. It's actually uh, going around an ellipse. An ellipse has, as we know from geometry, two focal points. One Kepler said is empty and the other one, that's where the sun is. And um, he also, and that is the second uh, law of uh, um, planetary motion, he says that a planet, given a length of time, would always cover uh, an area uh, which is uh, equal uh, to the area covered at an, another uh, place within the elliptical orbit. So here we have uh, a system of proportionality between time, uh, the orbit, and uh, the distance. And that led us to the uh, uh, third uh, law of Kepler, which was this one here. It said that the period of a planet's orbit squared is equal to the size of the semi-axis of the orbit cubed when it is expressed in astronomical units. Easy, isn't it? But what it did, it allowed now for the first time very precise predictions of where uh, the uh, planets would be in the future. And it had another effect. It did away with these horrible epicycles that Copernicus still maintained, but they were now no longer needed. Uh, the Copernican system was now absolutely free and without any contradictions anymore. This is the last home that uh, Kepler lived in, in uh, Ratisbon, and there uh, he eventually succumbed uh, to uh, malaria and uh, a, a serious uh, typhoid fever. He was buried not far from his home and a cemetery that was destroyed soon afterwards when Protestant troops raided the city. Uh, the city council has guessed where his tomb might have been. They erected this little pavilion and his bust is inside. And that pavilion is a cleverly uh, constructed uh, um, in the image of a pavilion that uh, graced the uh, first edition of Kepler's most important uh, book, The uh, New Astronomy. And uh, that is how Kepler is remembered in that part of Germany today. Kepler, and from Kepler to Fraunhofer, that is almost 200 years. Uh, during that time, a lot of things happened. The Holy Roman Empire disappeared. It was dissolved by Napoleon during the lifetime of this man, Joseph von Fraunhofer, scientist and inventor. He was often called the man who brought the stars closer to us. He was an instrument designer and builder, as I already uh, demonstrated. And uh, most importantly, he was an entrepreneur and a manager. He was the manager of a company that I would now believe is what uh, the, the closest we had in the uh, 19th century to what today is represented by Skywatcher and Mead and uh, Celestron and whatever 
the names are. Uh, there was disaster early in uh, the life of uh, Fraunhofer, a disaster and uh, uh, good fortune at the same time. He was working uh, as an orphan in uh, a glass factory when suddenly the house collapsed and he was buried in the rubble uh, of the ruin. One of the uh, eyewitnesses was uh, the man who was extending his arms here. He was the future king of Bavaria, Joseph Max I. And he was very much impressed by the young boy and kept from now on his protective hand over him, became his mentor. And uh, uh, more than that, he made him uh, or made him, brought him in contact with these two gentlemen on the left hand, Mr. Utschneider, and on the right hand, Mr. Reichenbach. These two were the owners of the biggest name in German optical industries. They used to immediately realize that um, Fraunhofer was a piece of gold and uh, they provided him with all the books uh, that he was always thirsty for reading. Uh, much of what Fraunhofer did was actually uh, self-taught. Uh, his only formal education was an apprenticeship in a, in a glass factory, but these two gentlemen made sure that he would get his hands on everything that he needed to uh, excel. And excel he did. Within a short time, they accepted him as full partner and more than that, as uh, a manager of the uh, factory. And um, here you see him in a reconstructed setting, uh, demonstrating the many instruments that uh, he made. He had very, very prominent visitors. One of them was Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was at the time the Minister of Science and uh, Education in uh, the state of Prussia. And he was also the brother of the famous discoverer, Alexander von Humboldt. And he ordered this fellow there, the uh, uh, big refractor of uh, Berlin, uh, as I already mentioned, it was the one uh, that uh, with which the planet uh, Neptune was uh, discovered. And it is a, a, a clone of the famous Dorpat a refractor, which is standing in the uh, um, uh, observatory of Dorpat near Tallinn, uh, ordered by the Russian Tsar himself, who came visit Fraunhofer in his factory. What Fraunhofer discovered, amongst many other things, was, and that allowed him the breakthrough uh, in the construction of refractors, was, first of all, uh, to isolate the impurities in molten glass, and he used this uh, crane on the left, and uh, this is the original oven that he used. And for the first time, it was suddenly possible to create glass in big sizes and pure enough to cut really big refractor objective lenses. That was his major technological achievement. Uh, this, by the way, is the uh, original glass factory where he a work near the monastery of uh, Benedict Beuren. You can still see it, it's now a museum. And um, uh, that allowed him uh, not only to construct uh, astronomical instruments, but also instruments used in the geosciences or in navigation. And uh, uh, that allowed him not just uh, the breakthrough in excellence, but also commercial success. Fraunhofer, uh, um, built not just these huge things for um, uh, observatories, he also improved on them. This one, for example, was equipped with a clockwork that uh, they, all, they didn't have electric uh, uh, engines at the time. So he constructed a clockwork that would uh, be of amazing precision in keeping track and self-guiding the telescope uh, while it was in operation for actual observations. And um, I said he came close to what we now have with Celestron and Mead as a provider for amateurs as well. He had the big expensive ones and he also had the smaller, uh, less expensive ones um, in his uh, uh, catalogs. And uh, that was really the beginning of a consumer optical uh, industry. Uh, there's something else that you need to know about Fraunhofer. He has his name uh, etched onto 
signs, they are the famous Fraunhofer lines. These are the lines, the absorption lines in the spectrum of uh, the sun and uh, other uh, stars. Fraunhofer didn't quite understand what they could reveal. That had to wait until uh, others like uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff detected spectroscopy, but he was capable of developing a technology to grade glass uh, to the hundredth of a millimeter and thus creating new spectroscopes better than the prism and allowing him uh, to define the wavelengths of line of of of, uh, of uh, light uh, with utmost precision, which in turn helped him design achromatic lenses of hitherto unknown um, uh, color correcting propensities, and uh, that is a, a lasting uh, achievement uh, that he had. And then he was the creator of heliometers. What are heliometers good for? Well, he, as the name indicated, initially they were used to measure uh, the uh, uh, angle width and uh, thus the diameter of the sun, but eventually they also allowed for measuring the uh, parallax of a star. And finally, as had been theorized long before, Frederick Bessel in Königsberg in East Prussia was able to determine the parallax of a nearby star. And that happened with an instrument uh, similar to that one. Uh, and for the first time, we were able to measure distances in interstellar space. And uh, uh, that is uh, another first that goes to uh, Mr. Fraunhofer. This one actually was made for the observatory. My hometown, Bonn, is still there. It's a beauty. I mean, you, you're hypnotized when you stand in front of this technologi technological uh, miracle. And as I said, the uh, uh, Fraunhofer uh, achromatic lenses that suddenly appeared on the market, they were better than anything that had been created before. People already knew they concluded that because the eye delivers a color correct image, it must be the various um, tissues uh, of uh, within the eye that allow for some sort of color correction. So they already experimented with various forms of glass, but really analyzing uh, the wavelengths of light with the precision that uh, Fraunhofer did, that finally allowed uh, for these ultra precise uh, objective lenses. So if somewhere in the attic or in your basement you find an objective lens with the name Fraunhofer engraved on it, or Merz or Utschneider or something like that, don't give it away. It may be well worth a fortune. Uh, another thing where Fraunhofer uh, should be thanked for by amateurs worldwide is what is called a German mount everywhere except in Germany where we call it a parallactische Mountierung. Uh, the idea to mount a telescope parallel to Earth's axis uh, was of course not new and Fraunhofer never claimed that he invented that. But what he invented was a very practical solution uh, which was both precise and allowed for ease of handling. And that is the um, uh, best example of uh, Fraunhofer's uh, German mount. Uh, which I think is basically still in use today. If you buy a small refractor, chances are that you get it delivered uh, with something looking very much uh, like this. And uh, the biggest German mound ever built, I believe, is uh, something like this. This is the great refractor uh, in uh, the uh, Astrophysical Institute in Potsdam near Berlin, it's the sixth biggest ever built, and I think today it's the second biggest still in operation. And uh, since then, they get away from German mounts because these really big ones, I think, now use altazimuth mounts. They also have uh, uh, image correctors, ultra precise. So uh, the German mount has come a bit out of fashion. Others uh, rest in fork mount style of uh, uh, mounting. Uh, but this was the thing that still enjoys a lot of popularity uh, amongst amateurs. And now, uh, finally, I come to Bernhard Schmidt. Bernhard Schmidt probably is the most colorful 
uh, of the three uh, gentlemen that I wanted to introduce here. I already mentioned he was born in 1879 in Nagen, Estonia, then uh, part of Russia. And he died on the 1st of December, much too soon, 1935 in Hamburg, Germany. I say much too soon because he wasn't able to live long enough to see a triumph of his breakthrough ideas. He was handicapped um, at age of 16. He was experimenting, uh, probably a, a prank of schoolboys with gunpowder and that ripped off a couple of fingers and he lost his whole hand because the uh, local uh, doctor was afraid that he might catch a gangrene against which they had no uh, medication. Uh, this was uh, before antibiotics. And the amazing thing is, although he lacked a hand, he became an extremely talented, not just engineer, but technician as well, who did much of the grinding and polishing uh, himself. He then had short uh, stints as a radio operator and a draftsman. And then he went for a half a year to a technical college in Sweden. Swedish was uh, one of his uh, many mother tongues. Uh, and uh, from there, he uh, went to Germany, where he was equally at home th uh, due to his uh, connection to the uh, German ethnic uh, community in his uh, homeland, Estonia. And that's where he would stay, in Medweida. I think he never graduated. He never had a, a degree or anything, but he was uh, quickly recognized as a natural for anything that had to do with uh, optics. 26, he became what we would today call a consultant. Then it was called a free collaborator for the Hamburg Bergdorf Observatory. And in 1929, he traveled with uh, Wilhelm Bader, one of the great uh, astronomers of the uh, 20th century, who started in Hamburg and finished his career in California at the Wilson Observatory. And between the two men, there were interesting discussions, and they led to the breakthrough, which was the uh, Schmidt camera, uh, which he started building from 1930 uh, onwards. Uh, these are the two institutes that uh, Schmidt could have chosen from. They were also eager to have him uh, in Potsdam, and Potsdam was probably one of the most renowned uh, research institutions in astronomy anywhere at that time. If you read who was uh, working there, it reads really like the who is who of cosmology, astrophysics, and astronomy. You have names like Ina Hatsprung from the Hatsprung-Russell diagram. You have Shina and Hartmann that every, uh, every, every hobby uh, astrophotographer will have used one of their masks uh, at one time. There was Kirchhoff, the inventor of spectroscopy. There were uh, people like Mikkelsen, who measured in the basement of that building there the speed of light with utmost precision. Uh, Albert Einstein was associated with that uh, institute. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, Schmidt could have uh, been a collaborator, but he wanted to be free, he wanted to be independent, and Hamburg offered him that chance, and the Prussian Minister of Culture, who was uh, fearing that it might be double dipping uh, Mr. Schmidt, he uh, finally said no to Potsdam. So uh, good old Schmidt ended up in the Hamburg Observatory, which was uh, still a very fine institute with very prominent names. There's even an Australian uh, connection there. Anybody ever heard the name of Romke? He was one of the two astronomers that Thomas Brisbane brought with him uh, to Australia. Brisbane himself, an astronomer, was uh, very important in building the uh, observatory in Parramatta. It was basically his baby. Uh, but he and Rimka had a fallout. Rimka said to Brisbane, he won't be allowing Brisbane to tell him how to research uh, because he was only loyal to science and not to military officers. And you can imagine how well that went down uh, with a, a Scottish uh, officer who knew nothing but uh, military discipline. Anyhow, when uh, uh, he kicked out Rimka, uh, the colonial administration nevertheless was fair enough uh, to stop Brisbane from uh, taking it uh, too much out on, on, on Rimka. He uh, 
was able to keep his salaries and that was continued to be paid. But eventually Rumke ended up as the first director of the Hamburg Institute. His son was the second and the man who hired Schmidt was the third. So there is a ever small, but there is a connection uh, to Australia. Schmidt was extremely humble. Uh, look at this letter. This is how he recommended himself uh, to the Hamburg uh, Observatory. What it says, it's handwritten here um, to the observatory. Uh, Please find attached some of my astrophotography. Uh, I did that uh, with a mirror of 31 meters of focal length. Uh, at uh, f1 to 150, I used a little device that I have invented and uh, that worked very well because I made sure that for 12 hours uh, the sunlight was uh, focused uh, at the same uh, position. If you want me to, I can do that also for you and I can also service all of your optical instruments. Uh, greetings, uh, Bernhard Schmidt. That was enough uh, for the uh, director to realize that there was really a genius knocking on the door. And from then on, uh, he was uh, solidly associated with the uh, Hamburg Bergdorf Observatory. He was living in that house. His uh, uh, laboratory was in the basement. And today that building is the Bernhard Schmidt Museum of Hamburg. Uh, he insisted on having his own workshop, which he himself uh, equipped. And that is where he did his polishing and his grinding, uh, uh, the one armed genius uh, in the basement uh, of that uh, observatory. As I said, um, Schmidt was obsessed with perfection. And one of the things that really uh, interested him was how do I overcome the inherent flaws in both reflecting and in refracting telescopes? In the past, uh, the uh, solution was solved in going big. Both types of telescopes had a problem with a very narrow field of view. The refracting telescope on top of that had the issue with uh, uh, chromatic aberration. And um, free, uh, reflecting telescopes had issues with coma and with uh, spherical uh, aberration. So uh, how to compensate for that? Well, in the past, they thought going big might have been the solution. The one is the Leviathan of uh, uh, Lord Ross, and the lower one is uh, Hevelius's refractor in uh, Danzig. Um, that uh, was... Uh, a possible way of overcoming flaws in your optical system, but probably not yet the I, the ideal one. And Schmidt thought out uh, something else. And the idea came uh, when he was discussing everything with uh, the man that I already pointed out, uh, Walter Bader, one of the great astronomers of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, he and uh, Schmidt discussed uh, how could we create an astrograph that combines the, the low focal length and the small f-rate with a large field of view. And uh, the idea that uh, Schmidt came up with was uh, the famous corrector plate. He suggested that if I put a meniscus lens in front of the primary mirror, that would disallow light uh, to uh, uh, create a spherical aberration uh, at the center of the focus, uh, then that might solve the problem. And he also designed a way how to do that. He said, we need to use the power of the vacuum and of air pressure to put the uh, corrector plate in such a place that the whole primary mirror uh, would be corrected. Uh, and by the way, all those who have a schmidt cassegrain telescope, that is the reason that if you ever feel the need to remove your corrector plate, you're well advised to always make sure that it comes back on at exactly the same points that it was before, because otherwise you lose much of the correcting uh, propensity of the corrector plate. Later on, that um, design was uh, uh, taken over by uh, uh, 
uh, other uh, telescope builders and one of the most popular uh, um, instruments is of course uh, the schmidt cassegrain uh, where uh, the compromise is now that you allow for a little bit of a larger uh, focal length but you pierce a hole like uh, cassegrain suggested a hole in the primary mirror and put an eyepiece there and uh, if you want to have again the advantage of a short focal length well no problem you can still put a shapley lens uh, in front of the eyepiece and then you can reduce the focal length by almost half so that was the great contribution by uh, uh, bernard schmidt which is uh, still uh, very much uh, uh, in um, use today but um, in earnest, uh, Schmidt's ideas took off only after he died. He died in 1935. And maybe there is something good about his uh, early demise. I don't say this out of bad taste, but you have to know that Bernard Schmidt was a man who loved life. He was a well and... Uh, uh, much appreciated patron in all the hotels and taverns around the observatory. And he was someone who spoke his mind. And in view of his own experience uh, as uh, an Estonian uh, ethnic German living in Germany during the World Wars, he was critical of ultra-nationalism and he was particularly critical of the aggressiveness of the Nazis. There was no doubt that he was in their crosshairs by the time he died and probably his early demise uh, saved him from uh, a very painful experience where even his mentors would not have been able to protect him. But after his death, his ideas took off big time. This is the Palomar Schmidt camera, which started uh, the famous Palomar uh, survey, uh, still one of the best photographic uh, surveys uh, available to astronomers today. It was finished with another Schmidt camera. This is the Oshin telescope. Again, exactly the design as uh, Bernard Schmidt has proposed it. And then you have Schmidt's everywhere. This is uh, the one that uh, was built in Hamburg. It is now in um, Palo Alto in uh, Spain because of the atmospheric conditions deteriorating in Hamburg. And on the right hand, that is uh, our Australian Schmidt, the UK Schmidt camera. Uh, which is still very much in use. I visited uh, Fred Watson there in uh, about 10 years ago. At that time, he was using that instrument to collect all the data for the uh, RAVE survey, uh, which has since been concluded. And uh, of course, the uh, uh, photographic plane has been um, replaced with uh, digital uh, sensors, but uh, Schmidt cameras are still very much in use, very much the preferred instrument of choice for surveys uh, of uh, all kinds. And as I uh, already indicated, they are very much uh, in demand in the amateur astronomer uh, uh, communities. And there are all kinds of uh, catadioptric uh, designs that are still very popular. And they all go back to that man Bernard Schmidt, uh, whom I hope I have uh, introduced, I was also able to uh, uh, demonstrate that he was really a fine, a fine human being. And with that, I come to the end of uh, my uh, uh, slide, and I'm very happy to answer a question to the extent uh, that I can. I have to add, I'm neither an optician nor am I a physicist. I'm a paper pusher. I learned law. Uh, everything I know about this, I learned from books written for lay people like myself, but I'd be happy to try to answer all your questions. I've seen a few comments, but no questions at the moment, um, Hans. But uh, I have a Schmidt Cassegrain myself. Actually, I actually have a Mead. It's uh, often referred to yeah. on the viewing Welcome field. Welcome to the cups. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's referred to as a coffee grinder because it's so loud when it moves. It sounds like it's grinding coffee. Um, we do have a question. Here we go. From LKLM Media, which is Lee. Um, SCT is often known as being called cameras instead of telescopes. Is that perhaps some obscure historical translation 
i.e. do I have a Celestron Smith Cassegrain telescope or camera? Uh, the original Schmidts were not called telescopes, they were called Schmidt cameras for the simple reason they had nothing that you could look through. What you had was a primary mirror above that, uh, a, a plate where you could attach a film or a photographic plate, or in later days, um, a digital uh, camera, and uh, nothing to look through. There was no secondary mirror, like in the Schmidt Kesselgren, the original Schmidt camera didn't have that. So it was a bit painful. I once operated a original a Schmidt camera uh, uh, made by, by me. So what you do, you set that thing up, then you open the optical tube, you place your film on that um, a plane for the uh, photography, then you close the optical tube, then you have to be uh, extremely careful uh, to avoid stray light reaching the photographic film, and then you start making your exposures. But uh, the uh, eyepiece, uh, and that only came with Cassegrain's uh, idea to pierce a hole through the primary mirror and attach a diagonal and an eyepiece. The original Schmidt design was a photographic instrument only, and hence it is called the Schmidt camera rather than the Schmidt telescope. That's actually really interesting. Never knew that. I, I just always thought they had just always had the eyepiece at the end and the hole through the middle and that sort of that system that we know today. Now that came that, that the at the origin of that were two Americans. One was a guy who was called uh, Thomas Johnson and the other one was called John Diebel. They were both founders of Celestron and Mead respectively. They saw the advantages in the Schmidt design and said what we need to conquer the amateur markets is somewhere to put uh, a uh, uh, something like like an diagonal and an eyepiece. And that's what led to the breakthrough of the uh, eight inch Schmitz Gresset Grand, which I believe in America at least is the most popular uh, amateur astronomy instrument ever. Yeah, there's a lot of them around. I know that, that's for sure. So Lee's response is, I thought it might have possibly been that in the end, we basically have to Schmidt camera anyway. It's used for astrophotos only and not visual. Uh, I, I disagree, use mine mainly for visual. I don't do use it for astro at all, that one. Um, but yeah, look, um, Hans, thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Uh, thank you very much for being here and coming along. Um, I know that we've got to find a speaker to send over to do a talk in Adelaide now. So we'll, we'll have to find out who we've got to send across. Um, we might have to get you back to, uh, to talk on some more German telescopes, maybe the Schiespiegler, perhaps. Oh, yeah, that is, uh, I, I, I never saw one, but uh, it looks adventurous, that design. It looks very adventurous. We do have a member who has one, uh, Barry. Barry Adcock has one. He uh, he's probably he's probably more qualified than yeah. I am. <laughs> I was just thinking of German telescopes. I thought, oh, the she speaker. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, once again, thank you very much for coming along tonight and joining us and presenting for us. It, it was a really informative um, talk. Um, well, certainly got a, I got a lot out of it. It looks like the comments coming through are saying that everyone enjoyed the talk, which is good. Um, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us. And again, thank the Astronomical Society of South Australia President Hans Notke for his presentation on Astronomy Made in Germany. Um, we hope you enjoyed tonight's stream and we look forward to next month's Astro Talk, which hopefully will be in a, a venue. It won't be Mueller Hall because Lightscape will be going on until August. Um, but thank you for watching tonight's stream. Don't forget to hit the like button on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube and ring the bell or hit the bell so when we stream you get notified. Um, but until next time, we will, uh, we will see you later. Well, thank you very much and good night. Good night.